we have the privilege, nay, the pleasure of a visiting speak, but not really. I introduce you, the Reverend David Wise. Good morning. That is rubbish. Good morning. Uh, nearly there. Good morning. So let me introduce myself a little bit because some of you uh, may not know me. Um, some of you may have forgotten. There was one person that came in this morning. I said, hello. And they walked past and said, hello. They came back and said, oh, pastor, they said. So uh, um, I've been a pastor here at uh, Greenford Baptist Church now for nearly 30 years. Um, I'm going to talk about when I started here in a moment because that sets the backdrop for um, what I want to share with you this morning. Now, part of our church vision here is to be a resource to other churches, other Christian organizations in other places. And uh, well, probably around seven years ago, no, more than that, 10, 10 12 years ago, I started uh, mentoring uh, church leaders in other contexts and places around seven years ago. I started working for, for Mission College. It wasn't called that then, it had a different name, called for Mission College now, where I was a tutor on their MA course, looking after the London students. And, uh, and then, uh, about four years ago, the leadership team here decided, and it was my suggestion, it, I felt this was something God was saying, that actually we should move for a change of senior leadership in the church here, that we, we should begin to see Warren moving towards becoming the, uh, the senior pastor here, and uh, that my taking a role as one of the pastors here. So we began that process about four years ago, and it became very clear that as a part of that, I needed to be around a little bit less. And at the same time, the London Baptist Association approached me and said, hey, we've got this church that is in meltdown in East London, um, would you be willing and available to go and help? So I went off to Keystone Church and uh, worked with them for 18 months till they called a new pastor. So just to bring up to today what I'm doing, um, I'll leave out the other bits over the last uh, few years. Um, I work three days a week for, for Mission College now. I run their central London campus. If you're looking, by the way, to do a fantastic degree course that will equip you in terms of mission and leadership, we've got a brilliant course which we run in central London. You can get student finance for it. It's, um, yeah, yeah, I am on a, I'm on a sales pitch. So, um, not because we're short of students, we're actually getting a, a huge number of, of student applications at the moment. It's really exciting. But if that's something that interests you, um, there are, it won't surprise you to know, I brought some literature with me. And in the foyer, you'll find some of our leaflets advertising our BA course, our MA course, other courses that we do, and details of our website, and you can go and have a look. So, that's the thing that I spend most time doing, uh, three days a week working for them. Um, I also still work at uh, Greenford Baptist Church, but I'm not here on Sundays very often for reasons I'll come to in a moment. Um, but I work mainly with the leadership here, uh, doing uh, some mentoring and looking at some of the issues around strategy and development. Uh, and also as a part of my work with the leadership here, I'm doing doctoral research at the University of Roehampton. And I'm actually looking into the history of the church here over the last 30 years and its development into a multi-ethnic congregation. And that's what I want to talk about um, this morning. Uh, so I do that as part of my work here. I also um, am uh, helping with another church in difficulties, this time in southeast London, a church that parted company with its pastor last year in pretty horrible circumstances. And I've been working with them now since July uh, last year, so I'm there uh, more Sundays than I am here. And I'm also still mentoring a number of, of Christian leaders. So that's what I do. Now, what I want to share with you this morning, and also when I come back, I'm actually preaching twice this month. I feel a bit like a red bus this morning. I mean, not only because I'm wearing red. I'll come to that in a moment. But, you know, I, it's actually 15 months since I last preached here, and I'm actually coming twice this month. So, so there you go. So what I want to share with you is some of what I've been learning 
and finding out in my research that I have been doing uh, over the last year. I passed my first year, by the way, so you want to give me a round of applause? That's good. And I want to reflect with you on some of that stuff as well. So we're going to be looking at some scripture together, some thinking together. Now, a warning for those of you that, um, that don't know my preaching style. Um, I wander around and I ask questions. And when I ask questions, they're not some of these preachers' questions. You know, they go on to tell you the answer. I actually want to hear from you. But I also need to give an additional warning this morning because I'm a doctoral research student at the University of Roehampton that anything you say this morning will not only be recorded by the um, uh, uh, camera here and will appear on the website, but it may also appear in uh, articles that I'm writing or pieces of research that I'm working in. In anonymized form, your name won't appear, but your comments might. So I need to... So if you speak this morning... I assume you're giving consent to that, okay? But speaking is not compulsory. I have to remind you that you're allowed to remain silent and all of that sort of stuff. So, do you know my ethics application to do four 20-minute interviews was 25 pages long? Ridiculous stuff. Anyway, so here we go. So, if anybody in the University of Roehampton's ethics department's looking, I think your system's a little bit overkill, but there we go. So... All right, I started here in October 1987, and uh, at that time, the congregation consisted almost entirely of white English people. There were just a handful of Caribbean teenagers in the church here who'd become a part of the church after being involved in Girls' Brigade and Boys' Brigade. And two of those, you know well, one of them's in the front row this morning, Mr. Adam Thomas, he was here, and the others on a family um, thing this weekend, a Mr. Steve Williams, they were two of the teenagers that were here, a Caribbean teenagers that were here when I started. The, the services were very traditional. Uh, we had a big organ, which sat over there, and we had five hymns accompanied by the organ. Um, but the congregation, even in those days, was not reflective of the people that lived around here. We had people uh, living around here who had uh, come from uh, South Asia. Uh, in particular, we had a growing number of people from India and from Pakistan and uh, Ugandan Asians as well who uh, were here. And, uh, and then we had uh, others that arrived from the Caribbean and a small but growing number that were coming into the area who were from West Africa. Now... The very first arrival of Caribbeans into our congregation came because of one of those teenagers that I talked about. Her name was Julia. She lived in Verulam Road, was converted and baptized here, and she worked in a hairdresser's just along by the bus stop over there and doing Caribbean hair. Now, you can tell I'm not a Caribbean, um, but I'm told that Caribbean women's hair, it can take all day to have your hair done, yeah? So while Julia had this captive audience, they couldn't go anywhere. They would, you know, she'd tell them about Jesus. And they started coming along to the church. And in fact, the second Caribbean that I baptized here came because initially Julia had done her hair, and she's here this morning. Karen, can you just stand? There we go. So she was the first convert here from the work that Julia did just down the road. And that was what began the process of, of Caribbeans coming into the church here. The other Caribbean I baptized just before I baptized Karen was a guy called David who was the son-in-law of uh, one of our church members here. Now, when as Caribbeans came and settled into church life here, a number of issues arose. And uh, when I come back later this month, I'm going to talk about that and talk about what happened and some of the lessons out of that. But what it did lead to was to the leadership team here making the decision that we were going to work intentionally and carefully to make sure that people that came into our congregation from other cultures were welcomed. Not just that we said hello to them and, you know, it's really nice to see you, but they were fully welcomed. So their culture, the stuff that they brought into the church was welcomed and included in the life of the church here. And we've worked at that ever since. And that's some of that I want to talk about this morning and I want to look at some scripture with you 
as well. So that's where we're going. So uh, we're going to start with Colossians chapter 2. So if you want to turn to that, I'm using for the first time ever this morning, just to show that even though I'm old, I still learn new tricks. I'm using something called the New Living Translation, which I have never, ever preached from before. So this is a first. So uh, it's not my copy. I don't even possess a copy of the New Living Translation. But Warren has very kindly loaned me one of his to help me with my preparations. So Colossians chapter 2 and uh, verse uh, 1 to 3 says this, I want you to know how much I have agonized for you and for the church at Laodicea and for many other believers who have never met me personally. I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I I want them to have a complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. In him lie hidden all the treasures of of wisdom and knowledge. The message uh, translation, most versions in verse 2 says, um, has this phrase, knit together. But the message version says, I want you to be woven into a tapestry of love, in touch with everything there is to know of God. And that being knit together, that phrase there is something that can be used for the production of tapestry. Now, I didn't have a tapestry to bring along this morning, so I decided I'd wear something that does look a little bit like a tapestry this morning. So lots of different colors that have been woven together. At the time that the New Testament was written, tapestries were really popular. In fact, if you were a proper wealthy Roman, you would have a tapestry hanging in your house. It was a sign that you had arrived, that you were a proper wealthy person, that you had a tapestry. So it was something that everyone was familiar with. And I've I've used this metaphor, this picture, for God's plan for Greenford Baptist Church of being a tapestry for around 25 years. And I thought that everyone else used it. I thought it was really common. I, I just thought... This was something that was normal. I have discovered in in my research in the last year um, that we have, we, not just me, but my supervisor as well, has been unable to discover a single occasion of any other church or any academic literature that uses the image of tapestry as a metaphor for church, as an image for church. This is something that is unique about. Green for Baptist Church. So what is it, what's special about tapestry? Well, I'm going to unpack some of that today. And there's another really important thing I'm not going to touch on today, but I'm going to come back to when I'm here later this month. Now, a tapestry works because of the distinctiveness of the different colours. Now, whilst I'm not wearing a tapestry, you can see and look at this that there are a lot of very distinctive colours in here that are different. And and as those colours sit side by side, you see a picture. But it's in the difference between the threads, the colours of the threads, the distinctiveness of the threads, that the picture emerges. Now, a lot of churches that are multi-ethnic, like Greenford, they they use a very different uh, metaphor for church. They talk about, a common one is melting pot, Or another one, they talk about soup. Now, I like soup. In fact, I'm having soup for lunch today, hopefully. Um, I I, I like soup very much. But when you make soup, you you take all of these different ingredients. You mix them all together. And, And whilst you can just about taste in the complexity of the soup, the different flavors, the distinctiveness of the ingredients is lost. Now, there's nothing wrong with soup. But with tapestry, the distinctiveness of each thread of the ingredients is kept. And it's that that makes the picture. And I want to take you through the New Testament to different passages this morning and show you why this is so important and so significant. But before that, let's do some work together. You up for that? Oh, come on. You can tell I've not been here for a while, haven't you? So uh, are you up for that? 
Well, we're going to do it anyway, so are you up for that? Right now, have a think about the different ethnicities, the different cultures represented in the church here. Have a quick think about that. Just think about, you can have a look around if you like. Other people, it's quite okay. And, and I want you to think about what some of the distinctive things that different cultures can contribute into the life of a church like this. You know, if, if we this morning had just been following um, proper white English ways of being church, there are lots and lots of things that we've done this morning that we wouldn't have done. Lots of them. In fact, most of the stuff we've done this morning we wouldn't have done. So, come on, what are, some of these, what are some of the distinctives that different cultures have brought into the church here or can bring into the church here? So, put your hand up, I'll come to you with a microphone and uh, let's see uh, how many we can, uh, we can generate. Andy, I'm glad you're here this morning because they're not, you know, you're used to me and, and, and they're not used to me because I've not been here for a while, but it's good that we're both here today. So, um, African cultures bringing in dancing. Dancing, yeah. Yeah, when we used to be here 30 years ago, we, the organ, I mean, you, you'd think people were stuck to the seats, do you know what I mean? And, and we'd sing a song, and, and if somebody raised their hand a bit, people sort of looked a bit, a bit you know, that was a bit, bit radical. Yeah, dancing, absolutely. Different foods. Different foods, yeah, oh, yes. All the richness of the wonderful different foods that, uh, that we have. Yeah, what else? Different language, but from English. Mm, different language. And it's not just about um, that people can do the same thing in other languages. When, when, when you pray in Yoruba, your whole way of praying is a different structure. The whole nature of the prayer, there's a different rhythm. And you bring all of that and express that into the life of church. Absolutely. What else? There are loads of things. I'll be back to you, but this lady over here was first. Dressing. Dressing, yes, yeah. Do stand up. There we go, you see? You know, a bit of colour brought into church life in terms of what, what we wear. Did I see a hand over there? You're going to say the same thing. Okay. Different types of music. Different types of music. Very good. There are lots of really important things we haven't got yet. So, keep working with me. I'm glad you're here as well. So, so you're used to working with me as well. Um, generational respect. Generational respect, yeah, absolutely. Uh, white English people, they don't respect their elders. But in other, in other cultures, that, that respect of older people is just embedded in the culture. Uh, absolutely right. So, yeah. Breaking barriers. Yeah, breaking barriers, excellent. Different ways of worship. Different ways of worship. Now, that, that different ways of worship is actually very interesting because... Um, it's not just about some are noisy and some are quiet. But, you know, one of the things about traditional English worship and the songs and the hymns, and I love English worship and songs and hymns, don't get me wrong here, but they're f and they're full of wonderful poetry and, and loads and loads of, of complexity in their hymns. And so when you're singing them, you're singing them with your brain. You with me here? But you take a song like um, the song we sang earlier this morning the Yoruba song we sang earlier this morning. Okay, now, in singing that song, it, it's not about what's going on in the brain, is it? It's about what's going on in the heart, what's going on in the whole of the body, in fact. The whole, it's a whole different way of worship. It's not about just cerebral thinking, brain worship, but actually it's about feeling. And one of the things that none of you have said so far, so I'm going to say it, is about emotion. All right, I, I go along to an English funeral. Now, nothing wrong with being English. I'm, I'm English, a white English, as you can see, even though I'm dressed slightly differently this morning. Now, you go along and you take an English funeral, and everyone um, behaves with proper decorum, and it's, everyone is, is behaving very nicely, and you, don't, you rarely get people crying. You never get people wailing and screaming. You never get people throwing themselves on the coffin or on the floor. That, in many other cultures, is a normal part of the funeral service. And it gives an expression, a vehicle for emotion that actually is just not there. Now, it's not that one is right and the other is wrong. It's that they're different. That's the point I'm making. A whole different way of, 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 
of being. I remember the very first funeral I took here for, it was um, Caribbean, first for Caribbean funeral I took here. And it was a young man who had been killed in rather uh, strange circumstances from Verulam Road. And uh, the family were here and we got to the point when we were about, about to leave and, and his two sisters threw themselves on the coffin, just screaming, just hysterically. So I'm standing at the side and thinking, now this is interesting, not seen this before. But there was this huge outpouring of it, which is absolutely appropriate in that, in that funeral service. So yeah, that whole side as well. So slayed, strayed slightly from different style of worship, but you get the reading. Any more? Yeah, Rangina. So different cultural values uh, that people have. Such as? Um, when parents and children and how they behave and things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Different postures in worship. Yes, very good. So, you know, you're proper white English people. So you sit down, you stand up, sit down. In fact, when we used to have five hymns, you used to stand up five times, sit down five times. <laughs> But there is a whole thing of actually laying down in worship, prostrating before God in worship. We do that with some of the worship things that we do here. So whole diff very different use and attitude to body, yeah. And we've talked about music, but musical instruments. Yeah, yeah, getting away from the organ. I mean, I do like the organ. You know, I'm, I, I, I miss the organ, I like the organ, it's nice. Yeah, I do miss the organ, I'm sorry. But actually, getting all of this other stuff, you know, the sitar and tabla drums and bells and all of that sort of stuff, fantastic as well. I would say in general, less structure and order, which allows other things to happen. So there's no real set way of things happening sometimes. Yeah, when I started preaching, um, uh, all in all white churches, um, you know, they send you the order of service in advance and you just had to write the numbers in for the hymns for the day. It was absolutely set. And you had exactly one hour, exactly one hour. If you went over, people were looking at their watches. And uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, whereas there is a whole different, it's a different understanding of, of order, actually. It is all still orderly, but it's very different. Yeah, what else? Uh, more participation. More participation, yeah. It used to, you know, proper English services. I'd stand at the front. I did all the, when I started, I used to do all the praying. Didn't, didn't used to have open praying. I still remember I got complaints the very first time I got someone else to come and lead in prayer. Um, someone rang me up and complained. You know, just a whole, yeah, different, different story. Okay, what else? The accent. Accent, yes. A whole range of different accents. Fantastic. And it's the freedom to express yourself the way you want to worship, not looking at and oh, somebody's looking at me. I have to, yeah, so the freedom. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we could go, oh, I'm very sorry, Pastor Warren, sir. Sorry. Uh, just probably it's different views of what the Bible is saying and how you come at it from your culture. That is definitely very important. Oh, brilliant point, brilliant point. I used to um, uh, think that the Bible only had, each text only had one meaning. And we had this um, sort of historical critical method. If you don't know what that is, don't bother about it. That you used to apply to get to the meaning of Scripture. And one of the things that I realized, and uh, I did a master's in biblical interpretation uh, back now in the 1990s. I, I began to realize that actually where you're standing determines what you see. Where you're standing determines what you see. And, and we know that physically. You know, you're, you're looking at, a, a, I don't know, a, a, a work of art or um, a piece of cut glass. And depending where you're standing, what colors and what shapes you see. But it's true socially as well and culturally. Where you're standing, your culture, your social uh, situation determines what you see. So as you read scripture, brothers and sisters, people from other cultures see stuff that you can't see. Mm. Deep stuff. Thank you. Um, I have an entire dissertation written about that if you ever want to, to read it. It used to be on the church website. I don't know if it's there anymore now, but, uh, but there we go. Okay, so there's, there's a whole load of stuff ar ar around that which 
Uh, and we could dig into it a bit, a bit longer, but we'll just park that now on one side. Turn with me, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. Ephesians 2 verse 8. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for it. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. Say that with me. We are God's masterpiece. Look at someone else and say it. We are God's masterpiece. I'll come back to what that word means, masterpiece, in just a moment. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Jump with me, Romans chapter 1. Verses 19 and 20. So let me read this and then you'll think, what? What's the connection between these two? Unless you happen to be a phenomenal Greek scholar and you will know the connection straight away. I'm not a phenomenal Greek scholar, by the way, but I do happen to know the connection because I've read some people who are phenomenal Greek scholars. So Romans chapter, um, chapter 1, verse 19 and 20 says this they know the truth because God they know, sorry they know the truth about God because he has made it known to them for ever since the world was created people have seen the earth and the sky through everything God made they can clearly see his invisible qualities his eternal power his divine nature so they have no excuse for not knowing God. Now, get hold of this. That word, masterpiece, and what is translated here, everything God made, is exactly the same Greek word. In fact, it's the only two places in the New Testament where that word occurs. Now, why is this significant? Well, it's significant for this. You see, we are God's masterpiece. Amen? Oh, come on. We're God's masterpiece. Excellent. We're God's masterpiece. So God's masterpiece, creation, I mean, that's the really big masterpiece. You know, we're just a little bit of creation. But God's big masterpiece, what does it do? It shows something about God through everything God has made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature. They have no excuse for not knowing God. So, masterpiece that God has made, when people look at you, masterpiece that God has made, they see something of God. They have no excuse for not knowing God when they look at you. Because you are God's masterpiece. Woven together, a tapestry that reflects in all of the difference and distinctiveness something of God. Isn't that exciting? You are hard work. Isn't that exciting? I think it's fantastic. I think it's absolutely fantastic. I, I do get a bit excited sometimes. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Well, I'm not really. I'm just an excitable person. So... How does that happen? Well, you'll be pleased to know the Bible tells us. Turn with me, John chapter 13. John 13 and verse 34 and 35. Now, you almost can recite these verses off heart because they're really, really well known. I'm giving you a new commandment, love each other, just as I have loved you, you should love each other. For your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Some years ago, on a, I think it was a Saturday afternoon, we had a celebration here, and we had the leader of the council was here, the local MP was here, some other local councillors were here. 
And uh, the leader of the council said to me, I really like coming here because this is such a mixture of cultures just enjoying each other. There is something about being together. We, we live in a world that's full of division, don't we? We live in a world where there is racism. We're going to talk about racism later this, this month. That's what I'm going to talk about. So we live in a world where there's lots of racial prejudice, where, where difference is actually seen as a reason for division. Difference is seen as a reason for division. We find people in our world who, me as a white English person, I can't tell the difference between one lot and the other. They look just the same, their languages sound just the same, but they hate each other. Their difference has become a reason for division. But here's the thing. When we as different, in all our difference, love each other, we make known something of God. We're an example. Many, many years ago, <clears throat> many, many years ago, Steve Clifford, who's now the general director of the Evangelical Alliance, he was here uh, with us. He worked with our leadership here for a while as a church helping us. And uh, he said that there was a calling upon Greenford Baptist Church. He said this publicly on a Sunday morning here. A calling on Greenford Baptist Church to be a model of reconciliation in a broken world. And that's something about the difference being together. As we love each other, we actually reveal and show something of God to each other. So, my second question, it's my last question. Not your last participation, but it's my second and last question today. How can... Our unity in diversity, our difference and yet our oneness, how can that make God known in our world? How does that work? Think about that question for a moment. How does our difference and yet our unity, how does it make God known? And while you're thinking about that, those of you who've joined the church in recent years, you may not understand the metaphor around these flags. There's something very significant about, and this was a deliberate choice, the way that this is laid out. These flags here represent the different ethnicities, the nationalities that are represented in the church here. And we refresh them every autumn. And they're on three sides. Do you notice that? They're not on the fourth side. And that's a very deliberate choice. And there is no, you go to a lot of churches, and at the front here, just behind the lectern, there'll be two flags. There'll be the flag that represents the ethnicity of the church, and there'll often be a flag of Israel. Very, very common. Very common. But there's no flag at the front here. Well, there is a flag at the front, actually. It's here on the left-hand side, as you're looking. It's God's flag. It's the colors of the rainbow, the promise of God. And on here, we've got 28 different ways that the name of God is written. Each of these was made by someone for whom this was their first language, having the word for God reflected here. You may be able to see your own language here. You might not. This was done many years ago. And on this side, we have the cross. You see, so we have our diversity here, our space for all of us here in our differentness. But what unites us is we are one together in God, our Heavenly Father, through the death of Jesus on the cross. So actually, we, we walk this Every week, that's why this is laid out like this. So, going back to my question, how do we, you've had plenty of time to think about it now, I hope you haven't got distracted listening to me, how do we, our difference, our unity and our difference, how does it make visible something of God? Well, since you mentioned rainbow, um, like light is, is made up of, 
all, all different, all the colours of the rainbow, which makes makes the light. And so, I'm spiritually, I would say that's how it operates. That you know, all those colours don't um, don't merge into one sludgy colour. They make light. That's a brilliant illustration. <clears throat> It's one I used in my dissertation, actually. That's very good. It's a brilliant illustration, the way the colors come together to make white light, because God is light and all of that. Uh, but it's, l l white light itself is a mixture of many, many different colors coming together. It's very, very good. Jonathan. I think, I think when people look at us as a church, as a body, um, normally people hang around because there's a common theme between a group or whatever but they'll be looking at the church and saying well how why is that person you know all the different people together and the common denominator is God so when they look at that they're, they're probably scratching their heads going well, well why and then when you drill down it, it is the fact that they you know love God and have God in their lives so brilliant yes in a world where there is so much brokenness and so much we've, we've had uh, over the years here at times when there has been a, a war, a civil war going on in other countries, we've had refugees from both sides of that civil war as a part of our congregation here, in membership of the church here. Mm, that says something about what God does, doesn't it? Okay, anything else? Great. I think we're all one in Christ Jesus and we all serve the same God. Yeah, great. That makes something of God known. It shows that there's no um, culture or ethnicity that is greater or more important in God's sight. We're all equal and our unity shows that, I think. That not, not one is dominant and therefore above the others. Absolutely. I'll come back to that in a moment. That's a really good point. Anything else? But there's a bit of the Bible, I don't know where exactly, where it says every creed and tongue and tribe like in heaven. We're going to read it. We're going to read it. It's Revelation. We're going to read it in about five minutes. Our, our congregation just reminds me of that. And so it should. And so it should, Belinda. We're going to come back to that in uh, not the next passage, but the one after. So I've got two more passages I'm, I'm going to look at. Am I, am I doing all right for, for time? That's all right. Okay, hi. And, uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Warren said to me, how long do you think you'll speak for this morning? I said, well, hour and a half, and he, he, went, he, went, he went a bit pale. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I, I was teasing him, by the way, so, um, well, I might have been teasing him. Some churches I go to, you know, they give me a minimum time to speak. I said, how long do you speak for? They said, not less than two hours. So, okay, I'm up for that, so, oh, yeah. Yeah, not less than two hours. If it's less than two hours, it's not a proper sermon. <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and uh, verse 12 says this, The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body, so it is with the body of Christ. Drop down to verse 22. Uh, In fact, some of the parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most Necessary. Now, I'm sure you're familiar with this, this image, this metaphor of the church being the body of Christ. Now, it gets really interesting when you put the body of Christ metaphor alongside the tapestry metaphor. Now, in a tapestry, the color that there is most of is the least important. In a tapestry, the color that there is the most of is least important. It's the background color. Nobody notices. What do people notice? What brings out the detail is the little bits of distinctive colour. In my head at the moment is a tapestry that I've, I've seen at the, at the British Museum. And there is these little flecks of red on the bridles of horses. And it stands out more than anything else. It's, it's that distinction. So in the body metaphor here, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something here. Now, it's always a bit dangerous when, when, when I do something like this, but anyway, um, you can always sack me. Now, if you are aware 
that in this church congregation, there are only one family from your particular ethnicity, or there are around three or less people from your particular ethnicity, your particular country. Can I ask you to stand? Okay? If from your particular country, there is only one family or three or less people, can you stand, please? Okay? Great. Just tell me the name of the country. Trinidad. Pakistan. 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 Yeah, same. Okay. Nepal. You're Nepal as well, because you're together, yeah? Sri Lanka. Say again. Sri Lanka. South Africa. Zimbabwe. You have to come slightly closer, I'm sorry. Grenada. 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 Thank you. Now, you people, you might... No, don't sit down. Did I say sit down? <laughs> you people are some of the most significant people in this church congregation. Because you bring a distinctive contribution from your country, from your culture, that no one else can bring. You've heard, or if you've been here long enough, you've heard Rangina recite Trinidadian poetry in a social evening? Yeah? Because no one else here can do that. She brings a distinctive into the life of church. Each of you has got the capability of bringing something distinctive to enrich the life of the church here in all the ways that we do. You may sit down now. Thank you very much indeed. We're going to come to the final passage I'm going to read this morning, which is a hint that I'm nearing the end, possibly. You know, Paul said finally and then, then, then wrote another seven chapters. <laughs> Revelation uh, chapter 7, verse 9 to 12. After this, I saw a great crowd, a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes, held palm branches in their hands, and they were shouting with a great roar, Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living beings. And they fell down before the throne with their faces to the ground and worshipped God and sang, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength belong to our God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. This is an image of heaven. And brothers and sisters, this is our destiny. Amen. Now, there's something, I've read this passage for years and years. I've lost count the number of times I've read this passage. And I realized something earlier this year. I was writing done a draft paper for one of my assignments and I saw something here that is so obvious but I'd never realized. Our ethnicity is eternal. Your ethnicity is eternal. You take it to heaven with you. Why is that significant? Because everything in heaven is reflective of God. There is something about the way that God has made the human race. There is only one race, by the way. The word racism is a misnomer. There is no such thing as racism because there only is one race, the human race. We'll come back to that in four weeks' time. There is ethnic prejudice, but that's another issue. Four weeks' time. There is something about ethnicity and the way that God made people we're all made in the image of God, aren't we? Yeah? Carlene, come and stand next to me. We are both made in the image of God equally. Amen? Yes. Carlene is a female. I am a male. Carlene is from Jamaica. I'm from the UK. We have very different cultures, but we are equally made in the image of God. Amen? Yes. Equally made in the image of God. So there are things in Carlene that reflect God that I don't have. There are things in my ethnicity and background 
that reflect God that Carlene doesn't have. But when we are together, we reflect God more than either of us do on our own. And I could re repeat this process by adding people from around the congregation. You get the point here, thank you. So when we come to heaven, we take our ethnicity with us. Isn't that amazing? There's something about your ethnicity, the uniqueness of it, that reflects something of the nature of God. And when you come here on a Sunday morning, you have an amazing privilege. This church is recognized, nationally recognized, as being one of the best examples of a multi-ethnic church in the UK. And when you come here on a Sunday morning, you have a little taste of heaven. This is something which theologians call realized eschatology. It's stuff from the future that we are actually living and experiencing now. Every Sunday morning, we come together, we worship, we have a taste of heaven together. We're still on a journey together haven't arrived we need to continue to respond to God's calling continuing to allow and it's here in my notes the things that you said our distinctive lights to shine so that together we reflect something of God as we live in harmony together this is two things brothers and sisters it's an anticipation of heaven and it's a revelation of God on earth. Amen. So let's just take a few moments just to listen to God, to what he's saying to you. Except for the singers and musicians, if you could join me please. Some of you might well have been uh, sort of spoken to by God about actually your distinctiveness and how currently it's not being used within the body. Not condemnation, but something for you to think about, to say, yes, actually, I've got something to bring. do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.